it. Hey, this is Steve Gorin. Sorry for the difficulties getting started. So welcome to my uh, first quarter in 2022 webinar on basis step up by trust modification, B dot by trust distribution, preferred partnerships refer to fees. Uh, so um, this webinar is an hour and a half. Uh, please please stay online for the whole time. Um, there will be uh, polling questions through it to confirm your attendance. Uh, and um, and there's also a little widget for the questions and answers. So go ahead and uh, ask your questions there. I'll see what questions I can get to throughout. Um, there, the, the, the webinar is um, is accredited in, in various states. Um, I'm not going to say the this, this CLE right now. Um, and at the very end, there will be an evaluation as well. You'll receive one after that, uh, after the webinar is over. And, and also, it, the uh, a link to the webinar will be, um, will be uh, sent to everybody uh, within within 24 hours after the webinar is complete. So the states in which it's accredited are California, Illinois, New York, Missouri. Um, Texas is probably uh, tentative um, or pending. I mean, okay. So with with that done, uh, let's get going and let's get into into the um, into the program. Okay. Okay, so we're going to talk about basis step up by trust modification. We're going to talk about uh, beam beneficiary deemed own trust by trust distributions, and we're going to talk about preferred partnerships, preferred to fees. And of course, you do have the slides. Um, so you also have in your resources my newsletter, and in my newsletter, uh, in the middle of the newsletter, you'll see. Uh, some yellow boxes, and what, you can click on a link to download my whole big PDF. Um, you know, it's a few thousand pages. And on this slide is, um, if you had the slides open and the big PDF open at the same time, um, here are instructions to how you can navigate um, to to find where, where I'm citing uh, from the materials. Okay, so um, basis step up by trust modification. We're going to talk about what formula general powers of appointment private letter rulings have approved and what prompted this topic was uh, a relatively recent private letter ruling. Um, how, and then we'll also talk about how to word a formula general power appointment for a beneficiary um, so that we can get uh, the basis step up. Um, and hopefully it's a step up and not a step down. But we'll also talk about how we can make it be only a step up and not a step down. Uh, and we'll talk about the tax effects of and, and reducing legal, legal exposure for modifying a trust. Okay, so what, what prompted my covering this is that the, uh, this letter ruling, 2022-06-008, uh, and in this private letter ruling, the trustee was authorized to distribute for the beneficiary's welfare, and such exercise of discretion by the trustee shall be final and not subject to question by any person or persons. So we had uh, this unreviewable discretion by the trustee, and and the trustee wanted to, to grant a testimony of general power of appointment um, and nevertheless, there were objections, even though the trustee's discretion was final and not subject to question. So they went ahead and did a settlement agreement, uh, of course, contingent on getting an IRS private letter ruling, uh, and, and that granted a testamentary general power appointment to appoint a defined portion to child's estate. So this next slide, slide six, I copied from the ruling uh, uh, some of the some of the language here. So the portion that was included 
that you can see the largest portion of trust B that could be included in, in the child's federal estate without increasing the total amount of the transfer taxes actually payable at the child's death over and above the amount that would be actually payable in absence of this provision. And then you'll see also what the what transfer taxes were defined, which are basically estate tax, GST tax, federal and state, etc. Okay, so what else did the ruling say? Um, the modification uh, granted the child the testimony power of appointment. Um, basically, the modification uh, will not cause trust B property to be included in child's estate. The so modification itself did not cause estate inclusion. However, the exercise by the child by the child of the child's testimony power will result in the appointed property being includable in the gross estate. So, so this language here in the ruling makes it look like only the property that actually got appointed by the child would be includable. Now, on the next slide, here's again some more language from it. So they concluded that the exercise by the trustee um, will result only in the trust property subject to the testamentary general power to be included. So on this slide it said subject to the power, and on the prior slide you can see it said the actually appointed property. So what in the world does this ruling mean? Does it mean property the child could have appointed? Um, any property the child could have appointed? Because that was subject to the, chi the child's testamentary power of appointment. Or does it include the actually appointed property? I'm not quite sure what it means. Uh, and we'll just, ha you know, who knows? Um, again, this is language I would not have used, and we're, I'm going to go through why that's the case and what I would prefer. So um, I'll mention in a moment there's a case that talks about the ability of the power holder to, to be able to um, to manipulate the taxable estate, um, and this ruling did not address this case that I'm going to discuss in a moment. Um, so the ruling um, really does not hit all the issues, and it's really, to me, a confusing ruling as to the result, as to what actually got included. Um, I do like that it tacitly approved that a trustee who could distribute for welfare may use that authority to grant the beneficiary a general power of appointment. So I think that that part is is, is pretty helpful. Uh, now, do you use a trustee who can distribute for welfare, which is the basis for decanting in many cases, or do you use a trust protector? Uh, and, and generally, a trust protector, you, you're going to exonerate them from fiduciary duties. Uh, now, I don't really think that you'd be able to totally turn off any duties whatsoever in the trust protector um, because the trust protector uh, really shouldn't do something that's going to be totally out of left field. Um, but, but the trust protector does have a, a, a large amount of discretion. So I do think the trust protector has some duties, but definitely not as strong fiduciary duties as a trustee would. So using a trust protector may be, uh, may be better when you want to try to amend the trust. But you know, you have what you have. Some trusts have, have trust protectors, others have welfare, others have other ways to do things. Okay. Um, Okay, so this looks like, so this was a uh, question here. Um, does the state inclusion always increase basis? So I'll let people answer it.
Okay, I think we can close the polling. And and of course, my answer that I like is um, that, uh, that that no, it could decrease basis when there's an unrealized loss. Um, so, um, and and we like the free basis step up. Uh, so uh, there's a, a coin that uh, a term that. Uh, Attorney Reed Moore um, coined at, at Heckling one year, which was uh, free basing, a free basis step up. And and here's what the results were. Um, so 75.4 percent answered answered no. Um, and and of course, uh, I like having some humor here too. So I we, we just want your attendance here. So. Um, so I'm glad for the answers. Okay, so um, this letter ruling, so um, Ed Morrow wrote an article on it in, 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 in Lineberg where he was advocating for using this general, using the general power um, and, and like baking them into your state plans. And, and he also wrote a much longer article that I strongly recommend people look at in terms of doing a formula, the optimal basis increase in income tax efficiency trust. And he goes through lots and lots of issues. Um, and, um, and then um, I really encourage you to go through it because he has a lot of really creative ideas and he does address the various issues, some of which I'm about to get into now. Um, and then take a look to see whether you agree with what Ed says or whether you have other opinions. But but he does set forth various arguments, and and each of us can come to our own uh, our own conclusion as to uh, what you know whether whether we're persuaded or not. Um, but I think that I mean if you go if you want to look at the arguments pro and con on various things, um, that this is really the best place to go and look. Okay, today's uh, pre, uh, first secret word is water. Please select the correct secret word from below. Okay, and this is for CLE credit. So this is where we're really tracking the attendance to make sure that people are paying attention. So the polling questions I had before are really more just for fun. Um, this is um, this is the, uh, the the actual thing for the CLE. Okay, um, I think it's about time to go ahead and move on. Um, okay, all right. So here's another letter ruling that talked about basis step up. So I'm going to go through, um, you know, this one and another one, and and then I'm going to talk about this the the law that really applies here. All right. So here's the 2004 private letter ruling, and here's some quotes from it. So you can see that here, the wife has a testamentary general power of appointment um, to appoint trust assets equal in amount to her remaining applicable exclusion amount, less the value of her taxable state determined as if she did not possess the power. So in, in that case, the assets over which she had a power of appointment were included in her estate. And here's the 2006 private letter ruling, and here's some, uh, again, some quotes from it. So this is, this is again, um, the same type of thing. Trust assets equal to amount to the, her remaining applicable exclusion amount, less the value determined as if she didn't possess the power. So, 
so you have these these rulings that are that are approving this this power of appointment. Um, are there any income tax consequences um, to the uh, the power? Uh, and I did discuss this in my fourth quarter uh, 2019 newsletter. And you can see at the bottom of the slide, there's a link. So that's a link to another CLE, a TCLE that I did. And so I orally discussed this idea here about whether there are any income tax consequences or modification. So I went through it um, pretty relatively thoroughly. Um, so I'm not going to go and repeat everything that's in that webinar, especially for those of you who heard it already. Uh, so you can go and get the details from it. Um, but but let me just summarize the bottom line. Um, so the bottom line for income tax consequences, which I think also is going to wind up applying for gift tax consequences, um, is does the beneficiary does the beneficiary have a right or 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 a reasonable expectation that is that has ripened into something that's like a right um, that is going to be frustrated um, by the trustee's exercise of this power or the trust protector's exercise or whatever. So, uh, and, and, the, and again, the question is um, whether it's like it's a commutation or a division. So in a commutation, I'll give you a typical example. You have a life estate, um, like, like, you have, like you have a Q-tip trust for wife, and then she has a life estate, and the remainder goes to the kids. And a wife may or may not get principal distributions during life. But, but we know that wife has this life estate, and you can't take it away from wife. So if you're going to do something to that trust that, that, that changes that life estate in any way, that's going to be an exchange. Now, contrast that to a trust that says the trustee can make distributions and the trustee's sole and absolute discretion, without any standards whatsoever, um, to the settlor's descendants. So, in that case, the descendants don't really have any rights because of this open-ended discretion. Now, if the trustee had been accumulating money for many years, they don't really have an expectation of getting those distributions. On the other hand, let's suppose the trustee gave the beneficiaries 20,000 bucks a year, like each beneficiary got 20,000 bucks a year. Well, now there's a pattern, and, and that's the way the trustee exercises discretion, and then there's, then there's some expectation by the beneficiary of getting that $20,000 a year. Uh, now, I'm not sure what the quality of the beneficiary's rights are, because it's still sole and absolute discretion. But I'm just saying that in a case like that, you're, 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 this is a very gray area. But in a case like that with the, with the pattern of distributions, you're much more um, likely to be concerned about whether there might be some income tax or gift tax consequences. I'm not saying that there are or are not because of the open-ended the open-ended open welfare. If it were for an ascertainable standard um, and distributions were made, then I think that there is a much stronger case for there being an income tax consequence and and a, and a gift tax. Um, so it, it's it's all a continuum and. So I like the fully discretionary trusts aren't making any distributions. Um, I think you can do a lot with that without worrying about it. And so, so again, you can go back and look at the different authorities on it. And, and I'm not saying there's a black and white answer to anything here. Um, I'm just trying to paint a continuum as to where you're less likely to be concerned or more likely to be concerned. Um, but, but clearly, if you had a 
a trust where the trustee hadn't been making distributions and they have sole and absolute discretion and they go and divide that trust up, that's not going to be a commutation. So um, that's an exercise of distribution authority. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. And what are the gift tax consequences of modification? Well, again, the question is, what beneficial interest is the beneficiary giving up? And, and then the benefit, should the beneficiary have sued to protect that beneficial interest? So if the beneficiary hadn't been receiving any distributions, it's really hard to put any, any significant value on that beneficiary's rights. It may be a, a totally nominal value. And there are some private letter rulings that have suggested that there could be a beneficial interest with only a nominal value. Um, on the other hand, um, if the beneficiaries, if you're basically like decanting a trust from one trust to another, and the beneficiary's rights are changed, um, then you may very well have Code Section 2702 applying, basically saying, whatever your beneficial interest is, you have given it up. And whatever you retain in the resulting trust, if, that, if that's not in the form of a qualified annuity, you know, kind of like a grant or a unit trust or something like that, then then whatever the beneficial interest that you made of a gift of the whole thing. So there is a potential nuclear remedy here um, if you can value that beneficiary's beneficial interest. And, and again, of course, the IRS will want, to, will want to try to use whatever whatever argument it can to to to, to get the higher value. Um, you know, again, if, if somebody affirmatively consents, then, you know, there's a potential for, it, like, a release, as opposed to if they don't object, well, that's more like a lapse, and, of course, you have the five and five power that's not a lapse, um, but, but also, if they don't object, maybe it's just because the cost of objecting is more than the benefit. So... I don't really, so I really think that um, it can be better to make sure that you are, um, you know, doing a, a lack of objecting rather than an affirmative release. So the, the other thing that you can do here is, you know, wh what if you have this, modification and the beneficiary doesn't object, but maybe the beneficiary didn't even know about it. So um, so the beneficiary might have this ongoing right to object, and perhaps that right to object increases in value as the trust gets more valuable. So you want to really cut off the beneficiary's right to object. And so you should provide some kind of a notice. And one of the things which I've done in some cases when I've done a decanting is I will, um, I'll have basically the trustee does the decanting and, and will give the notice, um, which under Missouri law and the Uniform Trust Code is about is one year, but it varies from state to state. Um, but the trustee will give notice and, and then that, that provides a time limit for the beneficiary to object, and and I include in there that if if a beneficiary objects, the trustee has the right to undo the decanting. So at the end of the year, so basically, if the beneficiary objects, the trustee can avoid liability by just undoing it. If the beneficiary doesn't object, then the time passes and the trustee is safe. So so that's a way to try to protect the trustee without having an affirmative release. Uh, and I already kind of went into the idea of trust protector versus independent trustee. Um, so, so now we kind of talked about whether a modification has any tax consequences generally, but what about the scope of the general power of appointment? So 
uh, again, it's like if you look at the top of the of the slide, you'll see the uh, 2H2K at the top that reference. So that's where you can find all this in the materials. And there's a case called KERS, and it looked to the ability of the person holding the general power um, to um, to maximize its scope. And KERS held that um, that in that case, the beneficiary could have manipulated the scope of the general power, and 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 basically it said we're going to include in your estate the maximum amount that you could have exercised control over through all of this. So you have to be concerned about uh, the the beneficiaries ability to manipulate and um, now I and the, there you see I have a quote here from the Kerr's case and and you can talk about it has no significant non-tax consequence independent of the deceased's ability to exercise the power and so what would be some kind of an independent consequence so fortunately there's a section in my material that talks about acts of independent significance so you can go there to get some examples of some things that are that are okay. Uh, but I'm concerned that the formulas in those in the uh, 2022 and the older private letter rulings uh, might not pass muster under curves. So I personally would not recommend using something that is directly from that. Um, from those private letter rulings. Um, so, the, you know, the, the other question with a lot of this is, you know, you, you may determine that, yeah, you like the scope of the power at this time, but then maybe it should have been worded differently, or maybe maybe you should have a smaller power because maybe there's a larger taxable estate or the tax laws have changed or whatever it is. But if you take some action that changes the scope of that of that general power, there might be a deemed release by the person who holds that power. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned about flexibility with these general powers. So I'd, I'd suggest um, allowing a non-adverse party have the ability to revoke the power holder's power. So the power does not vest until death. So they, in other words, so that, so they they don't have a vested right to it. That doesn't prevent the general power from from existing when the person dies, but because they don't have a vested general power, um, if it gets modified, if that if that independent person has a right to change the scope at any time, then there's really no release that can be going on by the person who holds the power because they, they they hold only the most tenuous of things. Um, it's, it's, it's only power that may exist contingent on somebody else doing or not doing something else. All right, so here's your polling question, and I'm just gonna do it really quickly. Do trust modifications trigger income tax or gift tax? Always, never, depends on authority to modify, or it's a po possible nuclear bomb. So we'll just run the poll for just a few seconds. And, and again, this is not the one for CLE credit, so I'm going to go really fast. I'm going to see when we start getting maybe more than half of the people who, who answer it. And then I'll cut off the poll so that we can um, get on to, to more substance here. Oh, it's jumping up. All right, I'll give another five seconds or so. Okay. Again, it doesn't matter what you answer. This is not for credit. So let's see what everybody said. Depends on authority to modify. 89.5%. So you are all paying attention very well, but the other slide, possible nuclear bomb, is, is also when I was talking about Code Section 2702, the beneficiary is is uh, giving up their entire beneficial interest potentially. So, so, it, so basically both of those answers I, I view as being pretty good answers. 
Okay, sample general power. So I'm going to just briefly talk about um, the, the elements of a good general power. My second quarter 2019 newsletter discussed this formula in more detail, and, and I verbally discussed it in, in that, in, in my uh, TCLE. And again, this is an on-demand webinar. You can just at any time click onto that link that's in my slides, and then you can fast forward to the, to the last part where it has basis of up strategies. Um, my form, what I'm about to go over is all in that 2H2K part of my, of my material. So it's, it's there right now. So you don't have to go back to my prior presentation to get it. But basically I have three elements. One is an independent person can revoke or modify the power at any time. The other is the power applies only to assets which would, which would give you a basis step up. It also applies first to the assets with the highest percentage built-in gain. But we also, I mean, I, I let the independent person change it however they want, but I expressly call out that you could change the ordering in, in that. Uh, and, and there may be assets with higher basis step up, but if the beneficiary is never, ever, ever gonna sell them, then why not give the basis step up to other assets? So, so that's a thought that's in there too. All right, so that covers the whole first segment. And I hope you found this helpful uh, and, and you'll be able to do basic step up. I really think that this is an area where we haven't really fully explored all of the parameters of it. There's no uh, tried and true formula that works. Um, there's, um, you know, you, you, you might see something where somebody might call out and say, well, you're just chicken if you don't try it. Um, to me, I, I think that it, it really is a potential minefield as well. So I typically put that, that sample power in only in circumstances where the basis step up is really important to the client. And, and, they, and they really would like to use a formula like that. Um, I, I work in um, powers to distribute for welfare. Um, I'll also sometimes use trust protectors or I'm doing it, I'm gonna now start doing it all the time, I think, but I, before a lot of times I just, I just relied on the power to distribute for welfare, but, but I'm leaning a lot more toward doing trust protectors and, and pretty much almost every estate plan now. Um, so, um, so the, so the, the, again, but this is not, I don't view this as an industry standard type of thing where you need to put this power in or you're violating some standard of care because I think that it is a potential minefield and so there is a risk that goes along with it. Um, but I do think it's a good idea to consider it and, um, and and you, you may consciously decide, no, I'm going to rely on the trust protector um, or on the power, the trustee's ability to make distributions for welfare. Um, at the same time, those people will really kind of have to activate the power. And so you rely on somebody taking subsequent action to get that basis step up. And, you know, that may or may not be the best result in your situation. Okay. So now... I'm going to talk about beneficiary deemed own trusts. So, so these are trusts that under Code Section 678, the beneficiary essentially has a right to withdraw from the trust. And, and while that right to withdraw exists, the beneficiary is taxable on whatever the beneficiary could have withdrawn. And when that right lapses, that, so 678A1 is when you have the right to withdraw, 678A2 is after the withdrawal right has lapsed. And, um, and, and so 678A2, there's a lot of uncertainty as to whether it would apply or not. There's lots of favorable private letter rulings applying it, but I think there's enough vagueness in the language that you could take either position. But here, I'm not talking about a trust that has a withdrawal right baked into it. I'm talking about creating a withdrawal right. 
Now, there are some people who believe that if a beneficiary is trustee and they could distribute under ascertainable standards, that that might trigger Code Section 678. And, and I very much disagree with that position, and you'll see something in my materials that goes over that. And you'll see uh, the various cases, and there may be cases that you may be able to kind of squeeze in there with a, with a distribution right. Um, but but um, uh, you know, that's a, that's a, a different story. Uh, I'm not going to get into that right now. But what, what I'm going to do right now is tell you what if you don't have the withdrawal right in there and, and you don't have the, the, uh, the, the beneficiary's ability to distribute for the beneficiary's own welfare, uh, like an unlimited right to distribute for their own welfare, which would really be the equivalent of a general power. Um, what if you don't have uh, something like this, but you would still like to make it be a beneficiary deemed own trust? Well, there's a mechanism that really hasn't been written about at all that I've seen, um, other than my friend Ed Morrow has written about it, and we'll, I'll, I'll tell you where some there's a class reference to his stuff. Um, anyway, so there is a way to... Um, to get this withdrawal right done. And 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 um, so I'm going to talk about what situations where shifting income to beneficiary may be helpful. I'm going to talk about this idea of crediting a beneficiary. Um, I'm going to talk about how to measure the lapse of withdrawal right that doesn't constitute a gift, how to word a withdrawal right in a lapse, and, and also some things you can do with trust to try to move them from trust or subject to GST tax to trust or outside the GST system. Okay. Um, so uh, again, uh, here's some resources that I have in this in this uh, in this next slide. So this is just where you can go to read up on the ideas that I, I'm about to discuss. Practical applications. Suppose you have an interest in a partnership. It doesn't distribute all its K1 income. Um, a lot of times that will be taxed at the highest marginal rate. Um, I have an example in the materials in that part 3A4 that's mentioned in that first bullet point. Uh, and so I, I'd recommend, uh, oh, 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 I'm sorry, in um, 3A4 is the discussion and 3F2 is the, is the example. Um, and so I encourage you to look at that. Uh, also, you may have an electing small business trust so that's a, that, that owns S Corp stock, the income is taxed at the highest rate and is trapped inside the trust. Um, there may be a way to make that be a partial beneficiary deemed own trust and have some of that income taxed at the beneficiary's presumably lower income tax rates. Another practical application, I mean, I am focusing mainly on businesses, but um, I think retirement plans are part of almost all clients. Uh, estates and we need a plan for those. And after the SECURE Act, uh, quite often IRAs and other retirement plans need to be withdrawn in, uh, over a relatively short period of time. And, and if the, the trust withdrawals are accumulating inside the trust, then that can cause you to have trust income tax uh, at a very high rate and the beneficiary may have a lower rate. So these are some practical applications of when you might want to do this. There's certainly many other times that, that you may want to have a beneficiary deemed own trust. So um, let me talk about this idea of crediting. So the idea first is crediting, and then that will create a withdrawal right, and then we talk about lapsing it. So what's crediting? So if you go and look at code section 651, 652, um, 661, 662, so you, there's, an, there's an idea in there that, that talks about um, in like mandatory income trust or whatever, but you, you also have an idea of, uh, particularly in, in 661, 662, that, that the, there's a, you, you will tax to the beneficiary distributions, it's basically amounts that are distributed, required to be distributed, or paid or credited, or sorry, paid or credited or required to be distributed. And so credit is in the code. And what in the world does that mean? That credit is in the code that we just kind of gloss over. So 
rather than define the legal terms, I'm just going to give you a practical example. So we have an ascertainable standard here. The trustee has a right to make distribution, has the authority to make distribution of the beneficiary support. And the trustee says, um, you know what, I think that it would be appropriate to make a $50,000 distribution to the beneficiary. So, so the, now, of course, the trustee could go and give that 50 grand to the beneficiary. But another idea is the, the trustee could go to the beneficiary and say, beneficiary, I have determined that it's appropriate to give you 50 grand if you want it. So here's the deal. I've exercised my discretion. I am now giving up my discretion over this $50,000. If you want this $50,000, you can take any part or all of that $50,000. Just give me a call, send me an email, whatever it is. You ask for the money, it's yours, and I have no right to stop it. I've already exercised my discretion. This is yours for the taking. So, for income tax purposes, the beneficiary is treated as having received the distribution. Because again, it says the statute says paid, credited, or otherwise required to be distributed. So this is credited. Now, um, so it's actually in the first year considered to be a distribution of this 50 grand. Now, what happens if the beneficiary doesn't take the 50 grand out by the year end? What happens to that to that money? So you could just say the right to take it out lapses, or you could say it continues. So what I'm suggesting here is that we would have the idea of a hanging power, just like with a crummy trust. Um, now, how do you measure this 5% withdrawal right in your hanging power? So uh, we have authority that talks about when you measure the 5% last of withdrawal right, one looks to the assets from which the withdrawal right can be satisfied. If you have a, a right to withdraw income, then you, you, ha you just multiply that income by 5%. That's not going to be a very satisfactory result here because we would like to have the right to all the income lapse out at some point. So what do you do? The key is increasing the pool of assets from which a withdrawal can be made. So during the first year, that's credited. There's really nothing fancy to do. You don't really do anything with that at all. You, they have the right, and they either exercise or they don't, or they exercise in a part. After the first taxable year ends, convert the withdrawal right from, be, from being the unwithdrawn income to the same amount, but say it can be satisfied from principal. So the beneficiary had the right to withdraw that 50 grand, and that was from a defined amount, uh, and, and, that's, and that's all they could do. In the subsequent year, they had the right to withdraw the 50 grand, but it's payable out of not just the income, but also the principal as payable out of all of the principal of the estate, of the trust, I mean. So, in the materials is a provision um, that um, Ellen Harrison and Carl McCaffrey initiated um, when, I, when I heard in a study group that, that they put this together. I asked them to take a look at it, and then I, I uh, gave them some comments, and they made some, some modifications. And, and so what you've seen is, what you see in the materials is Ellen and, Car and Carlin's doing for the most part, but with a little bit of input from me too. So, so basically what it says is the primary, in, in their case, they are giving a withdrawal right over the income. They, they, they're not doing the crediting. I'll, I'll talk about the crediting in a moment, um, but they're doing a withdrawal right. So I, I, I left their stuff in verbatim uh, based on when I got it from them. And this was like a couple years ago, I think. It was a, a pre-COVID thing. So, so their clause, the beneficiary has the right to withdraw all the gross income, um, including both the ordinary income and the capital gain. So just, just to make clear that we're not just talking about trust county income. And then any income not withdrawn will be added to principal and remain subject to withdrawal. Um, and so, uh, so basically... We have a November 15th um, lapse date, and, and, then it, and then it refers to, you see, the code section 2514E, that's the five and five power idea. Um, 
So uh, before I go more into this, here's a question for you. How do you convert a discretionary trust into a BDOT? Um, credit to deemed distribution, um, do a withdrawal right um, to code section 678, both of the above, or don't let the fish case catch you. You catch fish, got the fish case. I'll let people answer um, the polling question. A question, uh, a person asked, can you credit distributions for purposes of complying with the 65 day rule? And um, and and I, I believe so. Um, I think it's a little more dicey to me because you've you got kind of more of a matter of proof and all the timing and everything. So I think you could, but I have not really gone back to verify that. So um, so that's a very good question, and I don't know the answer. Um, I, I'd have to just go back and look at the statute. Um, do losses get passed out in a BDOT or non-BDOT? And the answer is that, yeah, if you have a beneficiary deemed owned trust, beneficiary deemed own a portion of the trust, and so that would give them um, the, the, the loss. Okay. So let's see how people answer the poll here. Um, credit to deem distribution, withdrawal right for 678, both of the above. And so, yes, those are all correct, but I like the fish answer too, because we just got to have some fun. Okay, measuring the withdrawal right, if income accrues to the trust in a particular year that is not received by November 15th, um, then the holder can direct the trustee to irrevocably assign to the holder the right to receive the income when it becomes available or to satisfy the withdrawal right. So you could exercise your withdrawal right to say, hey, trustee, I'm not letting this lapse. I know you don't have the money yet, but I am claiming it. So I'm, I'm exercising. I'm not going to let, let it lapse. Um, and so part of this idea is that you may have um, a, a pass-through entity. You get a K-1. And, and this is why we have November 15th. I, by October 15th, everybody's taxes have been figured out. And the beneficiaries figured out their taxes. If there's any so-called phantom income, some K-1 income, they could have had a right to withdraw. Um, but they don't really know what that amount was until the trust gives them the K-1. Um, or the, the trustee, or maybe the, you know, if you have an estate, the, per, the executor or whatever. So. Um, so they won't. They might not know the amount um, uh, the, uh, of that. So basically, the idea is by October 15th, they will have figured out their taxes. They'll be aware, well aware of whatever's gotten taxed to them. So we'll give them another month to exercise the withdrawal right. So that's why we have November 15th. Um, you might want to change that to even year end, just so that you can kind of get a day that's easy to measure the value. Of, of what's on the of, of what the assets are uh, when you multiply the five percent, um, and and then there's also in there the independent trustee may amend the trust to terminate the withdrawal right, but any termination shall be prospective. We don't want to have illusory withdrawal rights, but at the same time, going forward, we may recognize that they're not necessarily uh, going to be um, that they're that they're not going to be exercised. Um, okay. Uh, oh, there's the details where I just said on the slide. Uh, and then if you want to credit the beneficiary, you would just edit the above clause to have the trustee credit the income to the beneficiary and then get the income distribution deduction and then use that same clause. And so I have some potential language you might consider of the independent trustee making this distribution. It doesn't have to be the independent trustee. It could be just the regular trustee to make ascertainable standards. So um, it, it all depends on whether you are – what you're doing here. Um, here I was having an independent trustee just turning on a, basically a mandatory income withdrawal right. Um, so that why was, that's why I was an independent trustee. But, again, if you want to, you can have the, the trustee under an ascertainable standard, um, credit the amount, and then – put all this withdrawal right language in there. Okay, um, and um, if you're doing a K-1, there is a Sid Richardson case to be aware of uh, in the charitable area. I'm not going to take time to go into the details, but 
if you're trying to do this regarding K-1 income that the trust receives, um, then go ahead and take a look at that Sid Richardson case and just see whether you can get comfortable with this clause that um, that Carlin and Ellen uh, put together, um, or or you know, or whether or whether you're not comfortable with it. Um, so, because uh, the Sid Richardson is kind of an odd case, um, and to really you need to kind of go through all the details. If the pass through is an S corp, you really want to make a beneficiary dividend trust maybe convert to QSST. If it's a partnership, you could put it into an S corp and then make a QSST election. But there are a lot of issues on the exit strategy with the trust that concern me, so I'm not gung ho about it. Um, but it is an idea. I'm, okay, I'm not going to. Oh, okay, well, here we go. This is our second secret word. This is for CLE, so you do need to answer this poll. The secret word is spring. Please select the correct secret word from below. So I did have a question in the chat about if you fear a broad reading of curves, can we maybe just um, cap the, the the general power based on the applicable exclusion amount that's in place? So so we we could do that, um, but you would you would um, you'd be you you want to maybe subtract off an assumed amount that the beneficiaries of the state might have. So you, you you might you might so if the if the exempt ex applicable exclusion amount will protect six million dollars of assets and the beneficiary has two million dollars you might say the applicable exclusion amount minus two million dollars and then the beneficiary can't manipulate it and, and you have a hard cap there but again if you do that and the beneficiary's estate assets exceed two million dollars you know then you have a potential issue there um, so. Um, there's really no easy solution, unfortunately. Okay. Um, let's go on. Uh, oh, oops, uh, only 79% have responded. I guess I'll give another 10 seconds for other people to respond. This is for CLE credit. All right, I'm going to go ahead and move on. Okay, sale from one trust to another. Um, suppose that the seed didn't have enough GST exemption to fully protect the quest to a beneficiary. So the trustee created a trust that's protected from GST trust, which we refer to as an exempt trust. Uh, and, and, um, and, and yet, but there is a trust that's not protected from GST tax, which we'll call a non-exempt trust. And I know that's a little bit loose with some of the GST grandfathering language, but that's what we're using in our document, so we're going to just call it that. Protected from GST tax is exempt, not protected from GST tax is not exempt. So here's a strategy to use this BDOT idea. The exempt trust transfers up to $5,000 to a new to, to a new trust in a non-interest bearing account. The non-exempt trust has the right to withdraw that gift far enough in advance that the gift is not set together with the sale that is potentially going to be occurring here. Um, and in this new trust, an independent person is authorized to make unlimited distributions from the new trust to the non-exempt trust. So the non-exempt trust has a withdrawal right, and after that withdrawal right lapses, the non-exempt trust is still a possible distributee. And we need that second leg um, for two reasons. Um, one of those um, is we want to have the, we want to have um, the right under 678A2 um, that if the beneficiary, 6782 says, you look to see if the beneficiary be the grantor, would there be a grantor trust power? So the lapse is not good enough. There has to be some kind of a, of a grantor trust power left over, grantor trust with respect to the beneficiary. So if the non trust had been the grantor, then a right to distribute 
all of the trust assets back to the grantor would have been a grantor trust power. So giving the independent trustee the authority to distribute um, back to the non-exempt trust would have been a 677 power if the non-exempt trust had been the grantor, and so that will satisfy the 6782 requirement. Um, the other reason is that at the end of the day, when we're all said and done, then the very final year, the non-exempt trust may have tax liability without any way to pay it, and so we would like for the exempt trust to be able to um, give the trustee and the non-exempt trust at least enough money to pay income taxes. Um, so the trustee and the non-exempt trust doesn't get in trouble with the IRS. Um, another feature about it is the new trust has to have no features that would make the exempt trust be the deemed owner of any part of the new trust. Um, so we don't want to, oops, that was a typo in the slide. Um, this, it says important not to trigger, that should be code section 678B as in boy. Okay. Let's go on. Um, so the exempt trust would have terms identical to the new trust other than that withdrawal rights and the authority to make distributions to the non-exempt trust. So other than that, the exempt trust is identical. And arguably, the trustee of the exempt trust would have a fiduciary duty to promote having this new trust build up because it's got the same beneficial interests and the trustee, you know, trust is a relationship. It's not a legal entity. It's a relationship between the fiduciary and the beneficiary. And, and the trustee has a duty to promote that relationship. And if there's a way to get more money into that relationship, um, then arguably the duty, the trustee has a duty to promote that relationship and try to get more money into that, that other, that, universally identical trust. So the idea is that the exempt trust would guarantee a sale. So what we're going to do is we're going to have the non-exempt trust sell the assets to the new trust. The new trust is relatively thinly funded with only 5000 bucks, but the exempt trust is guaranteeing that note. So the exempt trust is putting a substance behind that note um, so that we have a real sale going on here, um, and 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 um, and and again, that's the not the trustee of the exempt trust is is guaranteeing this note um, because they have a fiduciary duty to promote this relationship. Okay, so while the the note effectuating the sale is outstanding, the non-exempt trust would use not note payments to pay taxes on the trust the new trust taxable items, and to make distributions to the non-exempt trust beneficiaries. So we would, um, you know, basically would be draining the non-exempt trust by paying tax on, every, by paying everybody's taxes, just like any sale to an irrevocable grantor trust. Okay, and I went into some detail about um, gift tax statute of limitations, um, sales between trusts. That I don't think you can run the gift tax statute of limitations when you do the sale between trusts. But you do want to take some steps to run the GSC statute of limitations, and that's outlined on that slide. All right, now I'm going to move on to the final topic, which is preferred partnerships and, and that those are um, preferred to fees. Um, so, I'm going to talk about how a preferred partnership works, when a preferred partnership is better than a sales and irrevocable grant or trust, when a preferred partnership is better than payment of fees to a partner, how a family office can structure investment management fees to avoid unfair tax treatment of investment expenses. Because um, we know investment expenses are non-deductible as a miscellaneous item deductions, and, and even after that non-deductibility expires after 2025, they would still be an AMT preference, so that's still not as good. And then, then we'll talk about how contributing to old and cold partnership interest outright to public charity would generate a better tax result than forming an intervival charitable lead trust.
Okay. Um, so what is a preferred partnership? A preferred partnership in that, and, 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 I, and by the way, I'm using partnership and meaning for tax purposes as a partnership. So we could, we could have an LLC, tax as a partnership, we could have a limited partnership, we have a general partnership, whatever. Um, but I typically um, think about this in terms of a limited partnership, um, even though you could do it with an LLC as well. Okay, so one or more persons, partners has a preferred interest, and one or more partners has a common interest. Um, the preferred interest would, would include a capital account that receives a percentage return on that capital account. And, and generally, the payments of that percentage return will be before making distributions to other partners. So let's suppose you had a million dollar preferred and there's an, an 8% um, what we might call coupon, an 8% preferred rate. So 8% of a million dollars is $80,000. So the first $80,000 of taxable income is going to be distributed out to that, that preferred partner before any other partners get any other distributions. Now, it does say pay generally before making distributions to the other partners. And, and why do I say that? That's because there may be cases where taxable income is going to be taxed to the people owning the common interest. So let's suppose taxable income were not 80,000, but were 90,000. And, and the partnership distribute only $80,000 generally. Well, you've got $10,000 of taxable income and that gets allocated to the common interest and those people need a way to pay their taxes. So I may give tax distributions priority to the preferred return payment. Um, so that everybody can pay their taxes first, um, and then you get the preferred return. So um, the the common so the preferred interest is the capital account. It gets a percentage return, um, and then when I gave the example of the million dollar preferred, basically that million dollar preferred would be able to be redeemed out for that million dollars plus any outstanding unpaid preferred returns. Um, a common interest, you would typically have a capital account. You don't have to, but you can. Um, but you would typically have one. And, and, and it gives a capital account, and there's a flat percentage of the profits that just, are distributed after the preferred interest receives distributions. So the goal is to maximize the initial value of the preferred partnership interest and to minimize the initial value of the common interest, and then you give all the future growth to the common interest. Um, okay. Um, I mentioned the preferred returns are not guaranteed. They, they simply get a priority distribution subject to my common on tax payments. Um, they are more risky than loans, and so they do require a higher return than interest on a loan. So that's a disadvantage to using a preferred partnership is you're giving a higher return back to the uh, moneyed person. Okay, um, so the preferred interest, I usually will accompany that by a 1% common interest as the controlling general partner. Uh, and, and that way you're kind of stapling the control to the preferred return. And from an evaluation viewpoint, if you have control over it, then the return is more likely to occur. So it's a less risky payment because you have control over the making of that payment. And so that can help reduce the preferred, required pre preferred rate. Remember, I mentioned that the preferred return is more risky than an interest payment because an interest payment is payable regardless of your income, whereas a preferred return is contingent on earning the income and deciding to make the distribution. So there is a premium for the preferred return. It would be nice to be able to cut down that premium, and you can cut it down by having the preferred, the person who holds the preferred also have a general partner interest able to force distributions out. Um, now, the remaining 99% interest um, tends to be interest as limited partners. It could include general partners as well. Maybe it would be non-controlling general partners. Um, 
Um, now, when you suppose you the person who has a lot of property, they contribute this property to the partnership. They get back a preferred return and maybe some common. But let's suppose they just they got back only a preferred return. If they got back only a preferred return, the IRS might say, well, how's that preferred return different from a note? Um, we, we were pretty sure that the preferred return is going to get paid anyway. Let's just, let's just call that a note. And there are actually some cases where taxpayers had their preferred return so rigged that it was pretty much certain to be paid, and the IRS recharacterized that. Now, there is a disguise sale rule, and there's a safe harbor that creates a presumption of no disguise sale. But in those other cases, the IRS was able to rebut that presumption because the preferred return was so certain. So just because you can be within the safe harbor doesn't mean you're totally home free. You also need to have something that, that looks good. Um, so we tend to suggest that the contributing partner receive common with a value of at least 10% of the total contribution that the partner made. That doesn't mean that they get 10% of the common because you have to look at what the other people put in. The other common interest may be putting in a lot and getting their common, or they might be putting in a little. So, um, so it, 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 it all depends. Um, on what the other people put in as to what that that 10% of equity looks like compared to the rest of the common. But the other point is that to make the cash flows and evaluations work, it's not unusual for the contributing partner to retain 15 to 20% of the common. So just as a practical matter. Um, okay. The the other thing is that with this disguise sale rule is that you want to try to be in a safe harbor and you don't want to cap cumulative payments on the preferred return. I mean, that that 8% that, that, that I was mentioning in my example, that's an 8% perpetual return. There's no cap on the cumulative amount that may be paid under that 8%. If there is, it can it can undermine your your disguise sale analysis and take you out of the safe harbor, and my materials go into that. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. I'm not gonna do any, um, any more polling other than the secret word. Um, so, Code Section 2701 strongly encourages the preferred payment to be cumulative. Um, if you don't um, pay a payment within four years, there's a gift, so, so you, you really do need to have this cash flow set up and, and get those preferred payments out. If you do have a preferred partnership, then Code Section 2036 does not include in your estate the right to the common interest. So just because you have that, um, you know, the, the, the right to have preferred payment, um, yeah, the preferred partnership interest is including your estate anyway because it's an asset you own. Um, but you're not going to whipsaw and get the common the common that the other people own brought back into your estate uh, merely because you have the right to this income stream. Um, so there are some cases on that. Now, uh, I think those cases are pretty solid, but of course, if you do everything wrong, the tax court can come along with a smell test, and 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 there is a case where it came along and 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 did apply 2036 um, when people did do everything wrong. Um, so it was a pretty blatant case though. Um, all right, so I mentioned the preferred partnership has a higher effective interest rate um, because uh, it has a higher preferred, a higher required return. Um, the, also there's an equity investment required by the other owners. Um, so, um, they're going to need to chip in more. So when you talk about seeding your your gift, like if you have a sale to an irrevocable grant or trust and you want to seed your trust and you're going to put in some seed money, you know, a lot of times that's going to be like 10%. Um, and um, 
I mean, it could be more, um, but but in, in a preferred partnership area, um, I you, I doubt you're ever going to be down at 10% for the common. Uh, I mean, for the, the common is going to wind up being, you know, a good 15 to 20% or more as a practical matter. Now, a preferred partnership interest has an advantage of a basis step up. Um, so, if you sell low basis assets to an irrevocable grant or trust, and and then the seller dies shortly thereafter, okay, then maybe there's not a whole lot of growth that escapes the state tax, but the assets are inside the irrevocable grant or trust, and and most people believe that there's no basis step up um, on the on what's inside the irrevocable grant or trust. Um, so. Um, so I would, um, I, I, so I would not um, want to be stuck with, you know, little estate tax paid, and you lose your full basis step up. Um, so if you use a preferred partnership, then the base of what you put in, in my example, of that million dollar preferred, that's included in your estate. So there is a basis step up on that million dollars. The common that you retain is included in your state, which may be bad, but you get a basis step up on that, which is good. But the growth of the common that you get outside the estate tax system through a gift or sale to an irrevocable grant or trust or something like that, that growth um, will be outside the estate tax system. So you're trading off estate tax savings for growth, but at least the only basis step up you're losing is on the is on the growth, not on the base. So the preferred partnership is is better for that for that purpose. Okay. Um, so what you'd want to do is to pair the concepts. So you retain the preferred interest. Um, and maybe you have the, the irrevocable grant trust hold the common interest. Um, if the senior family member gets ill, maybe that person will just buy the common interest from the irrevocable grant trust so the common interest can get a basis step up at death. Ideally, the, if, there's, if the, if the uh, settlor doesn't have the cash, the settlor would borrow the money. I prefer not to have the settler give a note to the irrevocable grantor trust because uh, people question whether that note that the trust holds would, um, has a basis equal to the principal amount. So I would try to avoid that because people have raised questions about that. All right. Um, let's get into the next segment. Um, and, and by the way, since I did start this seven minutes late. Um, I will be ending it seven minutes late so you can get your full um, uh, 90, 90 minutes in there. Okay, so um, compensating a partner for services performed. If a partner engages in a transaction with a partnership other than in the person's capacity as a member of a partnership, that transaction is considered occurring between a partnership and basically, you know, somebody who's not a partner, potentially an independent person. I, I was about to say independent person, but there's some loss disallowance or, or timing of deduction disallowance that may apply there. So it's not really the same as, as a transaction with an independent person. Um, so if a partner performs services for a partnership and there's a related direct or indirect or if there's a related direct or indirect, indirect allocation and a distribution of the partner, the performance of the services um, might be characterized as a payment in kind. Um, so you, like you can you can get a profits interest in exchange for your services, and that's fine. But, you know, what if you got a profits interest 
that the value is exactly equal to what you put in and it's time limited and you, you're getting it back over the next couple of years, um, you know, does, is that too good to be true? Um, I think you're still going to be okay in most situations. I mean, we do have a safe harbor for profits interests, but the safe harbor does have exceptions. And, and the IRS has gone after developers um, for, for developer fees that, um, that, get, that get recharacterized as, as interest in a partnership. Um, and, and, and so rather the IRS has said, well, you're getting property given to you, which is income at the time you receive that, you issue that profits interest. No, not that profits interest, but at the time you're issued that partnership interest instead of having the income recognized over time as you receive those profits. So there's stuff in my materials about the IRS's attack on developers in that area. I'm not I'm not articulating it very well, but I just want to let you know that developers who waive their fees and 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 get something back um, that the the IRS um, may be targeting that. So um, so just be aware of that. Okay, so um, what is a guaranteed payment, um, that's a payment of services. And I mean, that typically if you have a service partner and they're just, you just pay them a, fl a flat amount every year for their services they render, maybe they get profits in addition, maybe they don't. Um, but if they get a flat amount based on the services they render or rendered, that is a fee for services. So that is considered to be a fee rather than, a, rather than and interest in the profits. So um, basically, um, the you know the question is when is something considered to be a guaranteed payment? And and again, if it's not related to profits, what about a management fee? What if you get um, a payment, for example, five percent of gross rent? That's your management fee. Is that a profit's interest? No, because it's gross income. It's the rental, it's the gross rents. It's not the net income. It's not, it's not based on the income after depreciation and expenses and stuff like that. It, so it's, it's gross income. So because it's gross income and not net income, it is considered to be a guaranteed payment. So you can have a payment that's variable that's considered to be a guaranteed payment. Um, the other the other issue with this guaranteed payment is, see, if you have a distributive share, then you're reallocating profits from one partner to another, and the, you know so that's fine. If you have a guaranteed payment, then the the recipient of the payment, of course, recognizes as income, but the partnership now has to find a way to deduct that payment, and that payment may or may not be deductible based on what the payment is for and whether the payment is required to be capitalized or not. So you have to prove up the deductible payment just like you have to prove up any other you know, reasonable compensation. So you have to prove up the guaranteed payment. Uh, the other thing is that guaranteed payments are not qualified business income no matter the nature of the services or goods performed. An example is management fees. So if you have management fees, again, I'm, I'm picking on real estate developers, um, I, I think that to me, there's a lot. I have a lot of sympathy for this situation. Um, if the real estate developer, the, the person who's managing the property, is also a partner in the deal, then those payments that they receive are guaranteed payments, and they are not qualified business income for the 20% deduction under Code Section 199A. On the other hand, if that person were not a partner in the partnership, and they receive the management fees for managing that real estate, that would be qualified business income, and that would qualify for that 20% deduction potentially. So I think that's really unfair, um, and and I this is something that I also, that that, that um, I I led Actex comments on this, and we wrote in and said we thought that was unfair, and the Treasury said too bad. Too bad, so sad. We're not giving it to you. 
Those are guaranteed payment. Guaranteed payments are never, ever, ever qualified business income. Okay. Um, what if the partner performs um, service? So if you perform services as a partner, there's, there are three different ways you can be compensated. So one of them is through your interest in profits, just, you know, you're not getting a flat amount. You're not even getting a percentage of rent or gross rent or whatever. You just get your your profits interest. That's one way to for, to compensate somebody. And there's other than partnership profits, you have a 707C guaranteed payments. If you're an independent contractor and not as a partner, then 707A applies. Um, so the question is, even though you're a partner, are you fulfilling partnership duties? Um, and um, and so 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 the the issue is um, if it's you know unrelated to your duties as a partner, um, then maybe you can get that to be qualified business income. But um, but that's a it's a it's an uphill climb, I think. Okay, a uh, guaranteed payment um, is that is not a regular partnership distribution would be protected by Code Section 731. So if you, um, I'm sorry, a regular distribution of profits is protected by Code Section 731, so you can distribute in kind without recognizing taxable income, generally. There's exceptions. But if you have a guaranteed payment, that's a specific amount. If you pay in kind, that will trigger income. That's what that's intended to do, to deem sale. So um, a guaranteed payment is not favorable um, relative to a, a profit's interest, or maybe a preferred profit's interest. And, and here's um, the regulation where I was saying you have to find a way to deduct the guaranteed payment. Um, so, the bottom line is we don't like guaranteed payments uh, from a viewpoint of income taxation. They may be necessary for the business deal, um, but they're not tax favored. Now, what if you have a profits interest and that profits interest is very, 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 very likely to be paid up to certain thresholds every year? Um, is that really a profits interest or the IRS recharacterize that as a payment for services, like a guarantee payment. And so the, the IRS put out proposed regulations in 2015. And and again, I think this was more attacking the real estate developers who were trying, who were taking their developer fees in creative manners. <clears throat> um, but let's, let's look at if the family office situation so let's suppose that you you have a family office and they're getting the management fees. Those are non-deductible um, to the to the investing partners who you know, whose portfolio they might be running. Um, what what if instead you gave a portion of the profits to the family office as a profits interest? And that was how they got compensated for their services. And and then maybe you set up the family office as a C corp, and maybe it's a maybe it's a C corp with a very very modest profit. So as a C corp, it can easily deduct its its expenses, including any outside portfolio managers that it hires. It can deduct those. Um, but you've shifted the income to the C corp. And so you've given the equivalent of a deduction to the to the remaining investors. So this this is a way to consider doing it. But those, if you really want to run the gamut with those 2015 proposed regs and try to really be safe, um, because you know the IRS comes after family offices like this. Um, it's it's gone after. I mean it. I mean it. It, it lost. It lost one case. Um, and um, but that it, that was on the deductibility of expenses, not on the profits interest. And then there was another case that um, that it attacked, and the 
and 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 the taxpayer lost. It basically, I think they wound up with a very unfavorable settlement. Um, but um, so you know, the IRS is gunning for you. So for a family office doing this, I would want to try to comply with those proposed regulations. Um, in in many cases, um, it's particularly if it is a related party who owns the family office. So so I would so I would have them. Um, you know, I would want to try to run the gamut on these proposed regs. The problem is you have to take a lot of entrepreneurial risk with this and a lot of capitalization of the family office. There's there's a lot of hoops to jump through. My materials go through that, and I'm not going to spend time on that right now, but I would say you need to have be paying several hundred thousand dollars in management fees before you consider doing this. All right, now I'm going to get to the final topic, preferred partnership interest compared to a charitable lead trust. So if you contribute a preferred partnership interest to charity, that will generate a better tax result than forming an intervival charitable lead trust. So think about it. You have the preferred partnership interest. The charity is getting its payments every year, um, and then the common is owned by the family. So that is kind of like a, like a charitable lead trust. Uh, now, um, the benefit to this um, is that um, that all of the preferred partnerships distributor share of income automatically gets is going to get allocated to the charity. Um, also, when you sell the underlying property, the built-in gain associated with that preferred partnership interest also gets taxed to charity. And, and, you know, in many cases, it will avoid income taxation totally. Um, and you get an upfront charitable deduction. So this is much better than a charitable lead trust. My materials go into more details on, on why that's better than charitable lead trust. Um, but there's a, a tricky thing to watch out for, um, and, and that's the partial interest prohibition. Uh, and... Um, the, most people think of the partial interest prohibition as, as preventing you from having a split interest trust unless it's a unit trust or annuity trust, et cetera. Um, but the partial interest prohibition also applies to slicing and dicing things through a business entity. So if you are going to do this with a preferred partnership, it needs to be an old and cold preferred partnership. So form your preferred partnership for other reasons, and then maybe after another year or two, consider making a contribution to charity. Um, and uh, so basically, Stacy Eastland's remarks at Heckling this year inspired me to, to, to write up that, that idea. Um, and I am comparing this to a grantor or a non-grantor charitable lead trust um, because basically this lets you get the both advantage of both worlds. In the grantor charitable lead trust, you get the upfront deduction, which you get in the preferred partnership interest, but all of the trust income is taxable to the grantor. Um, and and in, the, in, in the preferred partnership, you have the annual income tax to the charity to the extent that the charity is getting it. Um, so anyway, so that is it. I've, I've, I've run out of time. Um, so I encourage you to um, submit your evaluations and, and to join me for my next quarterly webinar and Please keep in touch.